Well, I'm Brian Bircher. I'm Jennifer Mahan, and Brian's wife. <laughs> Black Dog started in 2006 in uh, in our garage in Summit Point, West Virginia, uh, just roasting then, doing farmers markets and some wholesale and mail order. Um, and we did home delivery. Home delivery. Yeah. And then we moved here and opened the uh, espresso bar at a retail shop in 2012. 12. Yes, 2012. And then we just celebrated 15 years. So we're on our 16th year of uh, providing fresh roasted coffee to our coffee fans all over. So. It actually started out as a hobby um, back in 2004. Um, I found out that you could roast coffee at home and I was kind of a coffee snob. I thought I was doing everything right, you know, buying quality beans and grinding fresh, brewing through a gold filter with spring water, just the right temperature and all that. Uh, what I didn't know about was freshness though until a friend of mine who was a home roaster sent me some beans and uh, that he had just roasted and the difference was amazing. The freshness made a, a heck of a difference. So um, I started to learn how to do it. and. Uh, so it was a hobby that went horribly awry, and here we are. <laughs> Not horribly. <laughs> what is it? What is it you say about when a passion or a hobby? Oh, fine line between a, a hobby and a mental illness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then once uh, I guess it was three years after the company started, I joined Brian, and uh, then just a couple of years later, we outgrew the house and needed. To to find a larger facility to roast in. And um, at the time, Brian was roasting five pounds at a time on a homemade barbecue grill drum roaster that he built. And uh, our, our it was so funny because we have five pound wholesale bags, but it would take two batches of coffee to fill one five pound bag because the capacity was small. So yeah, we needed it. You, you yeah. lose 20%. So you start with five pounds green, you'd end up with four pounds roasted. So to fill one five pound bag order took two batches to get enough to fill it. And we uh, had this nice opportunity with a beer brewery in Maryland that wanted uh, lots of five pound bags of coffee for their uh, Kucho coffee stout. Kucho coffee, coffee stout. stout. And Flying Dog. And I remember we were in our I guess the mudroom, the living room was where we staged everything and uh, we had all of these coffee bags there and it was winter and Brian's in the garage roasting and we were like, wow, we really need a bigger place. <laughs> so um, anyway, we've got these uh, cool historic roasters and um, back when Brian started roasting coffee, he used to live in Leesburg and Tell them about that. Uh, I lived in Leesburg back in the, uh, what was it, the mid 80s, I guess, and I, I lived uh, above an empty storefront in uh, 1986, a, a business moved in there called the Coffee Bean. And they had this machine here, this is Plutonius behind us. Um, and I used to go watch them roast coffee. This is long before I started roasting coffee, but I'd go down and have coffee and watch them roast. And I probably caught the bug, the coffee roasting bug there. And um, they, uh, retired out of the coffee business and the roaster was on the market in what 2011 11. 2011 and uh, um, we were able to uh, strike a deal a great deal and um, and so we had plutonius in our garage but not set up to roast we needed to find a place to put it it's a it's got quite a footprint and has requirements that we couldn't really fulfill in the garage so we started looking for a place and found this place and uh, yeah, and then, um, well, then since then, uh, back in 2018, we started searching for another roaster because uh, we were fortunate enough to have um, all of our coffee wholesale spreading far and wide, and um, we've had to increase roasting. So we bought a second roaster for a backup and to increase capacity. And so um, this is 1958. 68. Sorry, 1968. 1968. And um, incidentally, this one's 1931 over here. Yeah, so 31. Yeah, yeah. So it's great and. Uh, it's wonderful because it's historic. The coffee comes out wonderfully and unique tasting, and um, it's, it's wonderful for our shop. But uh, with the coffee, we used to handbag everything, and now we've got just awesome staff who helps us with everything, and everything's a little bit more mechanized as far as filling. Um, and then uh, we started roasting and making chocolate just 
was that? Last, this is our second year. Second year. Second year of doing so. We bought uh, the Appalachian Chocolate Company and thinking since uh, coffee and cacao grow in relatively the same areas, we were really lucky and uh, the former owner, Jack Meyer in Shepherdstown, um, he was retiring and so we had that opportunity. So now we have a chocolate lab in the back and we roast organic cacao beans. Oh, I'm sorry. We roast cacao beans that are naturally grown. I can't say organic, so <laughs> just sponge that or they'll be after us. Okay, so, <laughs> so um, uh, but we use all natural ingredients that are um, not adulterated in any way without any preservatives and limited ingredient and we stone grind our cacao beans for 72 hours and then hand pour and wrap every bar.
So it's become a really nice marriage with the coffee and the cacao because coffee and chocolate are like two of the best things you can have. And um, we're really happy to become a West Virginia brand and be able to, to do that. Uh, we buy specialty grade beans only, uh, which is the top five to 10% of all coffee grown. Only the top five to 10% qualifies as specialty grade. Everything we do is specialty grade, uh, high quality. Uh, we buy primarily from importers. Uh, we do have uh, one coffee, the Colombian coffee in particular, we buy from our friends at Tio Caneo in Colombia. Um, they come up here to visit and we've been down to visit the farm and uh, uh, we wanna do more of that kind of thing as time goes on, travel to coffee growing countries and you know, work directly with farmers. and. So it's not, we have a good buyer we've worked with for, well, since the beginning of the, yeah. the company. And so they're really, uh, they know our, our requirements and our needs for a really great coffee and the taste that, that we really like to roast here. So um, we have a good relationship. And then about every five weeks we get, I don't know how many pallets, but five pallets, five pallets. That's yeah. 7,500 so. pounds of beans. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, uh, so I think sometime next week, hopefully we'll get our re up here and then we'll be good to go. But so far we've been really fortunate not to have any problems getting access. Uh, cacao is a little bit different in that, um, it's not like the coffee industry where you have tons of people roasting coffee. There's very, you know, not as many chocolate chocolatiers and people that do the bean to bar. So, but right now we, uh, we've been really fortunate to be able to to get the beans we need and um, the Ethiopian's great we love mm -hmm. yeah well, it's, one of, it's one of our favorites and um, but we try to keep between um, eight and ten varietals so that there's a uh, different taste to please everybody's uh, palate mm -hmm. And different coffees uh, will shine more at different roast levels. You know, you know, like the Ethiopian is a lighter roast. It's a sweet coffee. Roasting it light preserves that sweetness. And, you know, some other coffees like the Sumatra do it, you know, better darker. So we try to have some, you know, a whole range of coffees for uh, for the public. I mean, everyone's different tastes. And then we make sure that everything goes out within 24 hours of roasting. As far as being bad, we bag it right away, but everything gets shipped out. So we've got um, mail order customers and wholesale customers, so on retailers, so they're getting coffee that is less than 48 hours fresh usually by the time locally. And then about 72 hours if they're in the rest of the state of West Virginia or Virginia or Maryland, and um, we're able to get the coffee fresh because we roast on demand. So nothing is sitting in a warehouse floor and, um, and we've got over a hundred places that sell the coffee and their customers too expect the roast date to be right on the front so they know the bag is fresh and so we really try to manage that because we don't want anyone to ever get stale coffee beans and uh, we work really hard to maintain that quality. And here on our shelves we, we don't sell anything more than 14 days past the roast date. First, uh, coffee's at its peak of flavor in the first couple weeks after you roast it, and then it doesn't just turn off, but the flavors start to degrade and everything. So uh, we don't usually get that old down here. Even it's moving fast enough, and we can roast it and just keep up with the, the freshness as it goes along. So. Right. Yeah, because ca caffeine um, or coffee is so delicious, but those oils get rancid, like uh, old peanuts or any kind of oil, and it gets a really bitter taste. So a lot of people who are like oh I love the smell but I will never drink coffee because it's so bitter and then they drink black dog coffee and they're like oh well that tastes really good and uh, but the freshness that's that's it's all about great beans uh, expert roasting and freshness like just it has to be fresh so we're yeah even if it's two weeks old I feel bad taking it off the shelf <laughs> <laughs> we just we started offering it for customers to buy because by the time two weeks if you're going to turn right around and brew it it's really at its peak of flavor mm -hmm. at 14 days like that's you can enjoy it but then at the end we don't want to do that so mm -hmm. most people wouldn't really be able to taste any difference until it's like 30 or more days old you know was, right. that's when you're really will start to notice but we figured that you know, the two weeks yes. is the peak so mm -hmm. yep. And anything that 
uh, that does, if we do have some, which again doesn't happen much, um, that we take off the shelf, we will we donate that to uh, local food banks or uh, grind it up or yeah, if it's two weeks old and fresh, we'll take it over to like some of the um, agencies that might have a lot of uh, mm -hmm. personnel that help our community, and we'll just drop off beans just to well, so they can enjoy it. But we don't like to waste anything because resources are precious. So um, we like to share share all of that without word of mouth. I think that would we wouldn't be anywhere. Really, mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely our customers that have helped us grow and expand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they support you know, not just us, but the other local local stores and businesses. And, uh, that's so important, the local economy. Um, I heard a statistic years ago, and I imagine it still holds true, that a dollar spent at a small business, a small local business, has three times the economic impact of a dollar spent at a big box store. So very, very important for the local economy. Absolutely. Uh, local jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and jobs are something we never in our wildest dreams thought we would have over 25 people working for us <laughs> ever. <laughs> so that's, I mean, and it's not a lot of, a lot of people, but for us, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a big company for us considering it was just two and sometimes three. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and the dog, and the dog of course. <laughs> Quality assurance rep right there. So, um, yeah. <laughs> He's That's busy. Java, yep. right? Java Bean. He's a Black Dog 2.0. And, uh, He's nine years old now. Nine. nine. Yeah. The original black dog was Bear. That's a pencil drawing that one of our customers did. Mm -hmm. He was the original black dog. Yep. He passed away in 2012, and Java came to us in 2013. Yeah. The Probat. This is a Java's Burns. You can see it from the top here. It says Java's Burns and Sons. This was manufactured in New York City in 1931. Um, Probat was around at the time. Uh, they've got some uh, still old machines out there. But back in the 80s, uh, uh, Java's Burns and Probat merged. Now they're called Probat Burns. They're the same company now. So these are sort of like uh, cousins. Um, they, you know, they are the, the same business now. but. Uh, but these old machines, they don't make the new ones like, like these. These are very heavy. That machine weighs about 3,600 pounds. Uh, it's a lot of cast iron, uh, which really holds the heat. It's kind of like a heat battery, you know, once you get it warmed up. Uh, newer machines are a lot of sheet metal and you know, computer circuit boards and, you know, all kinds of things that uh, we, we just like the older, simpler, uh, well-built machines. Not the new ones are well-built, too. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, I just love the old ones. Now, how much, you, you might have said this earlier, but how much uh, coffee will each one of these roast? Uh, we typically do 40-pound uh, batches. We can go up to 50 pounds in a batch. Uh, each batch runs anywhere, depending on the batch size, how dark you're roasting it, which coffee it is. Uh, each batch will run anywhere from 12 to sometimes close to 20 minutes on a larger batch, but that's the longest we would ever want to go. We try to stay right around 15 minutes per batch. But uh, on the larger batches, and, uh, you know, small batch you can you can run through in you know, eight to ten minutes. Um, but um, yeah, average uh, length is about twelve to fifteen minutes. I'm assuming your different bags of uh, green mm -hmm. coffee here. Yep. Costa Rica. That's a uh, Mayan. I'm sorry, Mexican decaf. Uh, water process. We don't ever do the chemical process. Uh, the next one is uh, Honduras in mean, Brazil that goes into our espresso blend. There's the uh, Cafe Tio Caneo from Colombia. Um, and got some Guatemala, Sumatra, Ethiopian. And we, these are also crops. We always use uh, what's called current crop. Um, you know, and, and, each farm, even from year to year, the coffee will taste different. If, like around here, sometimes the corn's this high, sometimes it's you know, seven feet tall. It depends on the weather condition, what's available to fertilize with, and things like that. Um, and uh, uh, we always want to be using the, the current crop. Now, right now, for instance, uh, they're harvesting in Central and South America, uh, probably about through harvest now. I may be wrong on that timing on that, but anyway, so new crop will start coming through soon. So, 
Uh, we always use that. Coffee, green coffee can actually store for uh, one to two years in the green state. Um, it's very stable um, before it really starts affecting the flavor, but we always want to be, you know, again, in the current year. Uh, once it's roasted is when the clock really starts ticking and uh, the quality is compromised over time. Like I said, we used to uh, weigh out every bag on, on the scale just by tearing the weight of the bag into the scale, scooping and filling each bag individually. And then originally we had a hand sealer. And then we graduated to a foot sealer, which made things a little bit faster. Uh, now we actually have this, uh, it's called a weigh fill machine. You put the beans up in the hopper, set the weight of the bags that you want to fill. And every time you push the button, it drops a half pound or a pound or a five pound, whatever you're weighing out into the bag below there. And we feed it right into the belt sealer, which pulls the bags across and seals them a lot faster than it used to be. Yeah, that's what we used to use up there, that little cereal dispenser. Yeah, yeah we used to oh, have that. Yep, yeah. and we have our foot sealer. <laughs> and then, scoop. Yeah. Yep, and then uh, about five years ago, we started making the uh, Keurig stock cups called iFill. And um, that was by, well, customers wanted them, but uh, that same, the year before the patent for the machines was up. So when we went to Coffee Fest, they had machines that made the single pod ready for sale. So we ended up buying one. And of course we've got our, <clears throat> our, uh, compatible single serve cups called iFill, so these fit in any standard single serve pod machine. And uh, we put 5.7 more grams of coffee in each pod, so you can brew a full 12 ounce cup that's not watery, which is really nice. And then you can recycle the plastic since it's number five plastic. Also, this system allows us to um, let me come around here. This system allows us to package fresh coffee in the iFill. Before IFO was available, we could have sent our coffee away and had it put into K-Cups or K-Cup similar products. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you couldn't put fresh coffee in it because coffee off-gasses CO2 for several days after you roast it, um, and that would actually blow the, the little cup open, the pressure of that off-gassing. Uh, it's, it's, it's a natural process, all coffee goes through it, but coffee that's in cans or sealed in vacuum bricks or in those cups has to be staled before you package it or it'll just blow the package, you know, blow the seal. Um, these actually have a, uh, a vegetable seal around that stays uh, tacky, for lack of a better term. And what that does, we, when the machine fills the cup and seals it closed, as the pressure builds up, it'll find any, the weakest point along there and let that pressure out. And then as soon as the pressure equalizes, it st sticks back down. So that allows us to package fresh coffee in these. So. Right. Otherwise, you have to leave the lid to the fresh roasted coffee for probably two to three days to let all that off-gassing occur. And by then, the beans are stale, have been exposed to air and water, and compromises the quality right out of the gate. So um, that's the same as soon as we've roasted the coffee, it's ground, and then put into the carrot style cup. So um, it's, a, it's a good one. If customers like to uh, enjoy a cup of coffee or tea, uh, we take great care and pride in really training our baristas on staff. So uh, we're we're very adamant about making sure all of our products are top notch. So we use uh, local dairy from Delightful Dairy right over in Maryland, and um, all of our filling products like the the uh, almond milk or uh, oat milk they're all really as few um, as clean, clean, clean yeah clean. as clean as possible and then all of our products in the shop they're local as well uh, but they're also as very clean as possible and we want to make sure that when our customers come here they can grab a treat and not feel sick later on because there were artificial mm. ingredients or yeah. uh, oils or sugars that, yeah. that aren't good for you. Yeah we don't have anything with any um, high dyes, high fructose corn syrup or anything mm, like no that. No GMO foods and uh, it's nice because we have a wonderful community that cares about their health and we're able to provide that for them here and um, so and then the rest of the products in our shop 
that is uh, a really wonderful arrangement because we've got so many producers and makers of cool things around, but there's not very many retail locations. So this gives them a place outside of farmer's market or Etsy, somewhere where customers can come and get something local. So uh, there's all kinds of nice variety. And uh, of course we've got the milk, egg, cheese, butter, and that sort of thing. And um, I think recently, as of about two years ago, we opened our shop next door, Junction Mercantile, and that's kind of like a pet project to Black Dog because Brian and I really believe in uh, self-reliance and wanted to give our community an opportunity to have great pricing on bulk foods or emergency supplies to help their families. And so um, we've even got some uh, over the fire popcorn roasters that we bought so you can roast your own coffee at home in case of an emergency. So we're gonna have a little class on that coming up at our oh, cool. yeah, Wednesday farmer's market. And uh, actually uh, both both stores also uh, we've really kind of come full circle on some things. Years ago when you bought coffee, you bought it either green and roasted it at home um, or you bought it from a local roaster. Um, everybody's seen the pictures of the old grinders in the uh, uh, general store, you know, we have one of those grinders out here. Um, uh, and it was actually, if, if you were outside of a town or a city, it was delivered by what they call the wagon men. They deliver groceries and coffee and things like that out to the rural areas. And um, uh, similarly with uh, uh, Junction Mercantile, you know, people used to have a pantry. You know, you didn't go to the grocery store every couple of days and pick up food. You stocked your pantry with flour and sugar and all those things bought in bulk, you know, so it's kind of kind of return to the old ways, you know. And, uh, yeah, and we like that because we're out in this nice area of the county and there's not many little, little stores that people can go to. So it's been nice and uh, we bought some bicycles a couple of years as well that, mm -hmm. that community members can rent and go take on the trail. So uh, we've done that. And then I guess our, our newest plans, our next step, that we're kind of finishing up this whole property is uh, we're getting the uh, license to sell alcohol like wine and cider and meat because we've got so many uh, West Virginia vintners and mead makers now. Uh, so we feel like we should promote that industry next door at Junction Mercantile. And, um, and then hopefully uh, in conjunction with that, our food truck will be back open to facilitate uh, just everything that you could want to enjoy with your family or stop by and then go in the back and hang out on the train observation deck or sit in the pavilion or get some shade and relax but we really we feel like we've been here since 2012 but we've known our community since uh well they've been so supportive and we want to make a really nice place where people can just come and enjoy and relax and feel like they're at home uh because this is our home mm -hmm. <laughs> we practically live yeah. here the community so. has built this as much as we have you know they, they've been uh it's fantastic. Yeah, it's really, just, really. But um, from the dogs coming in, I mean, we, we have so many dog customers too, you know, that they they are happy to come here as well. And we're always happy to see it. But um, have a pup cup. A pup cup, that's <laughs> right. They have a pup cup. But having uh, the coffee, we... Uh, one of our taglines is our beans are so fresh you'll want to slap them um, which is really cute but uh, when it comes down to it for us it's all good things through love and coffee and we really try to impact um, our community with the best things that we can offer and if it's right from customer service you know being told please and thank you and having just that little bit of extra niceness and smiles and having your drink carried out to you to show that we really care we're not we're not just a customer and we're not just here to you know make money off of whatever but we we care so much and um all of our staff here we our culture is that we do everything with a good heart and intention with love so from roasting 
mixing the beans or bagging it or making the drinks or making the chocolate, even boxing the mail orders, that everything's done with a lot of care and attention. And because these are our family members, so we wouldn't want to give anything away that we wouldn't want to receive ourselves. So that's how that's how we roll over here. <laughs> so. You mentioned how you have to take special care in training your baristas. Oh, yes. How much difference does it make having someone that's trained on the manual espresso machine and proper frothing of the milk right. as opposed to what a lot of people might be used to uh, when they're going to fast food and these different national chains and stuff that have automated machines? So the automated machines, they do, they do make a nice product. It's, I think it really depends on what you want, but um, in those automated machines, they're missing black dog coffee as the espresso beans. So I think right there, uh, that makes a difference. Again, freshness. If you uh, frequent other coffee shops or stop by, it's, it's, it's hard to find a fresh cup of espresso or get something that's been fresh roasted. Um, maybe two months old, you might get something that's a little, not super old, but not quite because um, coffee shops don't have access to that sort of beans unless they're in business with a roaster so uh but as far as barista training we we have a 90-day probationary period and in that 90 days 60 days is working on your shots pulling on pulling your milk but until you pass all of the steps in training you can't touch the machine um, it's very like, it's, you have to work your way up to it. So, and learn all of the things about coffee, like where it comes from, how it's grown. And we give a coffee 101 class and educate our staff so that they know where, where, why, and how everything is done. They're just not learning a piece of it, but we feel like education is really crucial for uh, a good business so that their employees know what they're serving and why. And um, we've had over, I would say, about 60 uh, business partners, shops that we've trained as well uh, with the same same thing that we do here mm -hmm. from uh, making sure that you're not over pouring and wasting milk or wasting product and that you take the care to serve the very best and that your measurements are correct. So uh, we always encourage our uh, brew partners to send their new employees here and we will train them and then send them back so that kind of helps but we we really go the extra mile when it comes to coffee because if you go to a coffee shop you want a great cup <laughs> i would add to the the human element you were talking about you know our, our baristas pulling a shot as opposed to some other places and you know, most places have baristas and they have good baristas mm -hmm. uh, some places are going more automated um, but you know coming back to the roasters for a moment we like these old machines because of the human element um, modern machines we can buy a machine that uh, is all automated we can put a, a profile into a laptop computer and jack it right into the machine just let the machine do it you don't have to train somebody how to roast anymore um, I mean you know to an extent, they, they need to understand the machine, but uh, but that takes a human element out. Um, these old machines are, of course, all manual, and uh, the roaster interacts with the machine throughout the whole process. Given different circumstances, you know, like uh, temperature and humidity, the coffee's going to act different one day as opposed to the very next day. Sometimes, and the same is true with pulling a shot of espresso. Environmental factors play a lot in that, and and an automated machine can't take that into account and make changes on the fly like a human can to bring out the best quality in the in the bean or in the shot. So. Yes, that's it. That's it. The quality human element, absolutely. And I think in this day and age where everything is AI and automated and um, the employees are, I mean, even if you go self-checkout now, you might have one person there for 10 lanes that comes and helps. So, and in this day and age where everything's really electronic and online, it's nice to see a face and get to know your community members. And um, it's just like having your favorite hairdresser, or barber, or, or barista, you know, or shop or restaurant. It's nice to have that personal touch. So I think, I think, 
a fully automatic machine and a regular espresso machine could have the same product, but you'll taste the love in the one where the where the person's going through all of the steps with good intent.